Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our home buying workshop. We are glad you all have joined us and we want to tell you a little bit about um, this webinar before we get started with our information. The first being that we are on GoToWebinar today and there are a couple things that are a little bit different. The first is that all of you are muted. This doesn't mean we don't want you to ask questions. There's a way to do that um, special for GoToWebinar and that's in the questions or chat panel of your screen. It's either on the right hand side of your screen or at the top of your screen. Um, and it says either questions or chat. This is how you ask questions during today's presentation. Um, and we will look through those. Um, and one way that we wanna make sure, number one, that you can hear us, and number two, that you can um, that you can find where that questions or chat feature is. If you could let me know, our, panel, our um, presenter today is wondering, how has COVID impacted your home buying journey? How has COVID impacted your home buying journey? If you could let me know the answer to that question in the chat, um, that'd be wonderful. You will be receiving the presentation in the slides and we'll re we're recording this presentation. It will be sent out um, probably within about 48 hours to your email that you registered with um, along with the slides. So if there's information that maybe you're not able to take notes on or not able to um, write down, just know that um, you will get that information in your inbox, hopefully within about 48 hours. And I want to introduce um, Kimberly, who's gonna give some more information about um, EAP. Thank you so much. So my name's Kimberly Smith, and I am one of the Employee Assistant Program Clinicians um, and, uh, for at Mass General Brigham. And we're really excited to be um, sharing this presentation and I'm glad you are all here today to focus on some home buying information. So that's really great. Uh, the EAP uh, is really a um, free confidential work life resource for all employees of MGB and their household members over the age of 18. Um, so we talk to people about many things um, listed on this slide here. So personal and well-being. We know a lot of you um, have been under a lot of stress, um, maybe some anxiety, maybe some grief and loss due to the COVID over the past 10 months. Um, we also talk to employees about workplace scenarios. We speak with not only employees, but managers as well um, to do consultations. We do workplace um, seminars, and we also partner um, as well with um, GoToWebinar and, and WPO for these types of seminars. We also have a ton of resources about family and life, um, whether that's childcare, elder care, legal, parenting, any lactation consultations. Um, we have a lot of great resources on our website. If you haven't been to our website recently um, or in the past uh, few months, we've, we've updated it. It looks really nice, it's wonderful, and it's listed here um, on the slide as eap.partners.org. You can actually make an appointment to talk to one of our counselors um, on the website now, which is really great. Um, you can also give us a call at the number listed, 866-724-4327, and speak to one of our, our staff. We have about 16 of us on the EIP staff, um, so there's always someone available to talk to, and that's 24-7. So even if you're not at work or um, it's the weekend and you really would like to speak with someone, we're always available for everyone. And that is all. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Kimberly, and um, thank you to EAP for hosting this in partnership with the Credit Union. Um, and we are so glad to be here. And this isn't our only presentation with EAP. We have a lot of great, um, a lot of great webinars throughout the year. So be on the lookout um, in your um, specific hospitals newsletters for all that we have coming up. I do want to kind of go through some of the answers of people who've talked about how COVID has affecting their home buying process. There's a good number of people who've said it hasn't affected them just yet because they're just starting the process, which is great. Um, some have said that it's been harder to look at open houses. It doesn't feel as casual as it did before coronavirus. That makes a ton of sense. Um, some people are saying there's just really low inventory and home prices have gone up. Um, and Unfortunately, some people have said that the homes that they've 
are living in now um, and they're renting from is actually being sold. So they have to move themselves and they're wanting to deciding to buy instead of rent this next time around. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce to you our presenter for today, one of the mortgage loan experts at uh, Harvard University Employees Credit Union, and that is Helen Lascaris, who's going to be presenting um, today. And so I will let Helen take it away. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking the time out to hear this presentation. And um, this screen, I just want to point out there's four of us. Uh, right now, four loan officers. I cover the Mass General area, although I haven't been at the main campus due to COVID, but everything can be done digitally. Mike and Sharon are at Harvard Square, and da Daisy's normally in Longwood, but we're all available, you know, pretty much 24-7, and our contact information is on our website. So if you want to contact one of us after this presentation, you know, we would welcome that. So let's go to the next slide, Sarah. So. I assume a lot of you are first time home buyers and at, at the credit union, we offer some, some discounts to first time home buyers. We offer you one eighth off our posted rate. We do a free pre-approval for you, uh, closing cost credit, additional credit available if you meet HUD income limits, reduced attorney fee. And as I said, we're available anytime and, and, and we welcome meeting with you and you can schedule a phone or Zoom call with us. Uh, whichever whichever you prefer. Um, so let's go to the next slide, Sarah. Um, I just want to say there's a lot of information here. So whether some of you it's just an idea and maybe for others of you who are, you know, your home is where you're living is being sold, it's a serious, you want to take action on it. I'm hoping that you benefit from this the time that we spend together, but it's a lot of information. And I recommend doing a follow-up call to get more specific and don't try to frantically take notes that you can, you know, get everything in. Just try to, I think, listen to the overview and just get the general process and flavor of it and then follow up. So uh, let's go to the next slide and talk about the process. Is it the right time to buy? Um, let's go to the next slide. Well, whether it's the right time to buy has a lot to do with you individually, but also you have to look at the market conditions. And as you all know right now, home prices are very high and the inventory is low. That's not great news for buyers. Um, it's been tough during COVID. A lot of people sat out and decided not to sell. But I do believe in what I'm hearing from realtors that I work with is that this spring, a lot of those sellers are going to come off the sidelines and sell. So um, hopefully it's going to balance out a little bit because when the market conditions are as they are now, it means that there's going to be a lot of offers coming in on, on a lot of the properties and, and they're going to be very competitive and that makes it harder to get an accepted offer. So I'm hoping that's going to change for you a little bit uh, this spring and that's what we're hearing. And let's go to the next slide. Um, the, the one other thing, market conditions, I wanted to mention that's not in the slide is the interest rates are very low right now. So it's all over the news. You know, interest rates are low. You know, prices are going up. So everybody's kind of focused on home buying right now. You know, up to even, you know, the federal level, you're hearing possible uh, first-time home buyer, you know, credits uh, being given to people uh, to help them with their down payment because as the prices go up, uh, your down payment becomes less of a percentage and, and it makes your monthly payment higher. Now, there are benefits. There are many benefits to owning a home. You're building equity. You could deduct your mortgage interest, but I think that's gone away. Um, you would check with your accountant on whether you would do that if you're itemizing on your taxes. But there's also just, um, you know, having your own space. And a lot of people since COVID, you know, and it's been in the news as well, are looking, you know, to move out of cities and more into suburban, uh, larger uh, properties. But keep in mind, you know, that's national news. In Boston, condos are still fairly a strong market. I mean, they may be dipped slightly, but they are coming back. And Boston is strong in, in, in every area of the market, the metro Boston area. Um, so there's the benefit of owning your own home, not having to move because, you know, your, your landlord has decided to sell 
or your rent going up. When you own your own home, you know, you probably hopefully will have a fixed rate mortgage um, and, and, and you'll have a lot more license to do different things with your home that you might not have when you're renting. So let's go on to the next slide. So as you go and contemplate this journey, you're going to have some partners. One of your partners is going to be your lender, which is, you know, the credit union is one option and we hope you find us a good option, but there's many options for a lender. The other party that's going to be really important is going to be your real estate agent. So you really want to select the right real estate agent. Um, and there's two, you know, the seller's going to have, many people don't know this, but the seller's going to have an agent and you're going to have an agent. And the commission is paid by the seller. The seller pays all the commission to your agent and to the um, seller's agent. So you're not responsible for paying commissions. Um, but it's important that you have your own agent because a lot of people go on Redfin they see, or you know, Zillow, they see a property, they go there, they don't have an agent. And anything you say to the seller's agent, they can share with the seller. So you want to be careful of things that you say when you're at an open house. If you really like that agent and you don't have your own agent, you could consider hiring them to be your agent too. Um, but it's, it's, it's most recommended that you have your own agent, the seller has their own agent. Um, let's go to the next slide, Sarah. Um, and what do you need to consider in terms of an agent. So it's really important to select the right agent. You want a full-time agent that's experienced and knowledgeable, and you really want an agent that's working in the communities you're looking to buy in. So, you know, I have someone, for example, who I'm working with right now, she's looking to buy maybe in, you know, Metro Boston, but she's also considering New Hampshire. So. She's been having trouble because her agent doesn't want to go to New Hampshire, you know, and show property. So she's, every time she sees a place in New Hampshire, by the time she can get up there, it's sold. So you really need to have someone that's based in the community you're looking in. And if, like this person, you're looking in, in far away communities that aren't bordering each other, for example, Braintree in New Hampshire, you may want to have two agents. You may want to hire someone for New Hampshire, and, and, and they want you to sign an agreement that they're representing you. Because once you sign the agreement, that means they're going to get the commission. So you could, if, if you're looking in, in different areas, and many people are right now because they're expanding their searches due to, you know, costs and different considerations, there's nothing wrong with hiring two agents and saying, you know, I'm hiring you for the next three months to represent me if I buy a home in Braintree or Quincy, but I'm hiring another agent if I do buy a home in New Hampshire. And and most agents will be okay with that because the, they don't want to go to New Hampshire. They can't do the best job for you. Um, so that's all I really want to say on that is that it's really important that you interview your agent, someone you're thinking of working with. So you want to ask, how many buyers did you represent last year? How many listings did you have last year? Because you really, it's important that your realtor is somebody who's, you know, really entrenched in the communities that you're interested in because you might be able to hear about a property that's coming on before it's listed and maybe try and get an offer in and get something going ahead of time or be one of the first ones at the open house. And, and, and get a little leg up that way. So I, I really recommend that you spend a lot of time um, trying to find the right agent by asking, we have referrals, asking friends that have bought or family that have bought, doing some Googling, and, 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 and I can't emphasize it enough to make sure that agent is someone that is, um, you know, uh, meeting, you know, fits well with you. It's not someone that's really pushy if you don't like that or you want someone that's aggressive. So uh, I, I, I can't say enough about that. So let's go on to the next slide, Sarah. So you have to help your agent too. You really have to think about what is it that you want in a, in a home or a condo or what is it that you need? So you don't want to be taken to see properties that it's absolutely, you know, a no-go if there's no garage or I need at least a, a half bath, one and a half bath or the ability to put in a half bath or whatever. So you have to um, help your agent 
help you. So really that's something you can do before you even hire an agent. Just be looking online a lot of properties and noting things you really, you know, I don't like this. I could live with it. I have to have, it's funny, I had someone said he had to be 10 minutes from a market basket. That was his criteria. He had to be near a market basket. So, but that's really crucial for an agent. So they don't waste time. You don't waste time. And they're showing you things that you really like. And a lot of times a good agent, um, you know, if, if they can, you see something, you see something online, you tell your agent, I see something I really, really like. And the agent can, but I can't get there till the open house this weekend. You know, I have meetings. I'm busy. Maybe the agent can go and preview that property to tell you, oh, yeah, you've got to be here Saturday morning or don't bother. It had a dated kitchen. It had this. It had, you know, so that that was really good if your agent can preview things for you, too. Um, and you want your agent to do an analysis of properties that have sold recently. So you could this is a good way to, to figure out, you know, if the agent is someone you'd like to work with. If you're interested, say, in a condo in Cambridge. You would ask, could you do an analysis in my price range? First, you have to determine your price range, which that's what we can help you with. Um, and then when you see their analysis, you get an idea of, you know, how they work, you know, the quality of their work. Because in this hot market, there is a lot of overbidding. And if you're going to overbid, you want to do that with the confidence that the property is worth what you're bidding which is likely being recommended to you by your realtor who you want to have faith in and trust in. So, so that's why it's really important to have that, that, that really good realtor relationship. So let's go to the next uh, slide, Sarah. Um, there's one thing I wanted to mention because, you know, a lot, uh, prior to talking about this slide is, what do you do first? Go to the realtor or go like to the lender, to the credit union? And, and we have people do it both ways. But my, my thought is um, that you would go to the lender first to get pre-qualified. That means your credit's not getting pulled. You're just discussing, this is my income, these are my assets, this is how much I have for a down payment, how much would I qualify for? Then you would take that information, go to your realtor, and they can tell you what properties are in those price ranges, and you're either going to you know, try to save more money or... or, or expand your search to other communities if you don't find anything you like. And then when you're ready, you need what we call a pre-approval, which will be talked about later, which is when we're pulling credit. So then you would go back to the lender and get your pre-approval. That's what I think makes sense. Because if you go to the realtor, they're going to say first, they're likely going to say, well, how much can you afford? And then that leads you back to the lender. So that's just a recommendation. So there's now on to this slide. Considerations when choosing a community. I mean, you know, since COVID, everyone wants, you know, a larger space, you know, more space. So things have changed. Do I, I don't know if this is going to be a, something that's going to go on into the future or, or as we have COVID under control, that people are going to kind of go back to what they were looking for initially. If we'll be going back to work or working remotely, I don't think, you know, or a hybrid of it. I don't think any of us know. But some of the things that people really consider when choosing a community are school districts. And we have a link that goes right to the Mass Department of Education that you can look at SAT scores, graduation rates, MCAS scores, things like that. A lot of people are interested in their commute. You know, they want to be near public transportation. Um, so, so we're providing you with, with, um, you know, that link. And you may, you know, you, if you're looking at the commuter rail and things, you, you may, you know, find some locations that you didn't even think of that you could consider that aren't that far to get to work from. Um, and then you might want to do market research on a community like crime statistics or, um, you know, budgeting. And is there any prop overrides coming that could increase taxes? How healthy is that the finances of that community? So those are, you know, some of the main things that people look at when they when they select a location or, or they select a community. So I would, uh, you know, urge you to to do that, you know, background information. And it might open you up, say, if you're a first time home buyer and your price point is really, you know, you're dejected that you can't afford anything and say Melrose or Stoneham. But maybe if you're looking at the commuter rail, um, you know, map, you might 
there might be some other communities that really aren't out of your reach just a little bit further, you know, to explore that option and possibility. So let's go to the next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about the purchase process. So if, if you have relatives out of state or anything like that, they might tell you one thing. Now I'm telling you another thing. Each state has a different process. So in Massachusetts, it's a two-step process. The first step is called the offer, and the next step is called the purchase and sale. So let's go to the next slide. So, I, so you, you go to see a property, you really like it, now you have a pre-approval, now you want to make an offer. So it's like a two-page document that will be completed. It'll say how much you want to pay, how much you're putting down, are you going to get a mortgage, for how much, when is the lender going to approve that mortgage, are you going to do an inspection, which we highly recommend that you do? Um, you know, in this hot market, people are waiving things, meaning they're going without an inspection to make their offer more attractive. We can't recommend that to you, um, you know, because it's a big purchase and, and there could be some hidden issues with, with a property that you wouldn't want to buy it without having the knowledge. It's been thoroughly vetted. There's two things in the, in the process, an inspection and an appraisal. They're two different things. What, it, what we're talking about now is the inspection. So when you make your offer, you have about up to five days to conduct an inspection. You hire your own inspector, and you have to pay for that. So if you end up backing out, you lose that, that money's out of pocket for you. Um, and the inspector is going to, you know, turn the heat on, open all the windows, turn the faucets on, check the plumbing, check the electrical, you know, check the sill to see if there's any rod, any infestation check the rules. So, so that's what they're looking at, the condition of the property. And in New England, you know, no property is perfect. So, you know, you're not, you're going to get findings on your report. They'll give you a report after the inspection. And some of these things might have been expected. You knew the kitchen was, was dated and that you would need a new kitchen. But, you know, if you find out that the boiler's ready to go, and that's not something when I offered that I was anticipating, then, you know, you may say, well, I'd like to get, a, you know, in addition to the offer I made, I would like to get, you know, some money off because of the boiler. If they agree, then you renegotiate it. If they don't, then, you know, it falls apart. And another, you know, the, they'll put it back on the market. You do usually give a $1,000 good faith deposit with your offer. And if your offer is accepted, then that's kept by the realtor and, and it, it's deducted from what you're going to pay in the end. If, if the inspection goes poorly and you back out, you get the money back. At the offer, it's, at this stage, you can get out after the inspection. So um, the other thing, you know, usually when you make an offer, you don't let the seller have a week to decide. Your realtor is going to say, we want to know by 9 o'clock tomorrow. You're just trying to put a little pressure on them to make a decision you know, you don't want a bunch of other offers to come in or them to say, well, let's wait around and see if we get something better. You want to kind of give them, you know, not a lot of time to decide that's customary. And they could either counter offer you if it's a really low offer, just outright decline your offer or accept your offer. So let's go to the next slide. And, you know, this is just telling you a little more about the inspection. So the property inspection oh, is Helen. what I described. Yes. Hi, Helen. One moment. Before we move on to this part, we have a couple of questions that may be a good time to ask them before the inspection. Okay. Um, one of the questions okay. that came in, is pre-approval necessary because I'm expected to pay a mortgage? Is pre-approval necessary? Well, a pre-approval is necessary if you're going to be making an offer. No, no seller is going to accept an offer without knowing that you're qualified. And the pre-approval part includes a credit pull. That's necessary. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if they could clarify. A pre-approval is necessary if, if you're going to make an offer, yes. If you're just looking, you don't have to have a pre-approval. I'm just not sure about the mortgage part of that question. Thank you. I'll wait. I'll see if they submit any follow up. Another question that okay. came in: Can you make an appointment to just find out where the my numbers are, or should excuse me, where my numbers should be, and the amount that I may need as I am rebuilding credit history? Absolutely. That's what we're here for. Whether you're two years away or two months away, 
we want to help you, you know, kind of navigate this whole thing. You might be closer than you think. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, you know, minimum credit scores, et cetera. Uh, I, I think it's worth scheduling an appointment and just talking it over. I mean, we, we aren't the only lender around. We don't offer all the programs that are out there. And we're happy to, you know, let you know what else is out there that might work for you, even if it's not the credit union. We are here as a resource for you. So please make the appointment and let's talk it over. That's what I would say to that person. Thank you, Helen. Uh, I'll drop the, the link to make an appointment in the chat. And those are all the questions we have at the moment. I'll turn it back to you. Okay. So I was just talking about after you get an accepted offer, uh, I'll just go over this briefly. You know, you do your general home inspection, as I said, you could get, there are additional inspections that, um, you know, cost more, like a pest inspection is not included in the general, and you could, you know, opt to do more inspections. Most people don't. Some do a radon inspection because it's inexpensive. Radon's like an odorless gas that could be in a basement and could be cancer causing. But if, if there was radon, it's a very quick, easy remediation, so it wouldn't be too much of a problem. So let's move on uh, about the inspection from this. Um, so then the next, after you have your offer accepted, then you need to get an attorney. You need your third partner. So you've got your uh, realtor, you've got your lender, here's your third partner. You need to hire an attorney because this is a contract, the purchase and sale. Everything in the offer is gonna flow into the purchase and sale, including your mortgage contingency that says, if I get denied for this loan, I get my money back. Because with the purchase and sale, you have to put up 5% um, of the purchase price or less. If, if you're a first time home buyer and you're doing a 3% down loan, obviously you can't put 5%. So you might be putting up your whole 3% with the purchase and sale. And it's a document and a contract that's created by the seller's attorney. Your attorney reviews it. You know, we can recommend attorneys uh, to you for the purchase and sale that your realtor will have attorneys but th the key takeaway from this is it's binding and um, once you give the deposit unless you get denied you can't really get out of the contract they'll keep the deposit so let's let's go on to the uh, next and and one thing I want to mention this is Massachusetts in New Hampshire there is no offer the document that you sign if you were going to buy a house in New Hampshire is the purchase and sale so before you sign it, you might want to, you know, uh, say, I'd like to have an attorney just take a look at this just to make sure. Because usually in New Hampshire, the realtor just writes it up and you sign it. But I would recommend having an attorney quickly review it and we could provide you with, with an attorney. So let's get to this part, which I think is where everybody's at, which is the financing part. How much do I qualify for? Where do I start? What do I do? So let's go on to the next slide. Where do you start? Um, credit is crucial for home buying. Um, the industry standards, we can go from, it's a low of 620 um, up to a high of 830. We recommend, I mean, I recommend if you can get your credit, I, I, I hate to set the bar super high, at least in the 700s, and the high 700s is the best. And there are ways to improve your credit score. So that's another reason to talk to us. Um, we also partner with Greenpath, Medallia, you know, works a lot with them. To, they can help you do a credit report review, but we know some of the tips of the trade too. If there's two people applying together, then we pull your credit from all three of the major bureaus, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, and we use the middle score for qualifying for the mortgage part. Keep in mind, if you get a credit score from Credit Karma, it's not gonna be the same one we do. It should be ballpark the same, but there's many models out there um, and, and the mortgage industry uses some very specific ones. So it might be a little different, but that's a good guide for you. If you're two people buying a home or a condo, we're going to look at both of your credit and we're going to use the lower middle score. So, you know, uh, it's important if you're joint for two people to have good credit together. Because sometimes if we have a couple and uh, one person has good credit, the other person's credit is fair. We always see, can we do the loan with just the income from the person with good credit? Only because if you need private mortgage insurance, which comes into play if your down payment is less than 20%, credit is going to really impact the amount of that payment. So let's go on to the next. 
You can get a free credit report. We also are here to, you know, talk to you about credit. So this is how much can you afford? We can do the pre-approval, like I said, but that involves the credit pull. If you want to do a pre-qual, which a lot of people throw those terms around interchangeably, they're not. At the credit union, the pre-qual uh, means that we're just talking, like the person that said, should I make an appointment? Yeah, let's talk about your credit. You should have, we're looking at all the debts on your credit report and the minimum monthly payment. We're not looking at your cell phone bill, uh, utilities. We're just looking at probably whether you have student loan payments, credit card payments, car payments. You know, those, those are the, the list of the monthly payments on those debts is what will be helpful for you to have when we talk prequal, as well as your, you know, how much you have in retirement, how much you have in your savings. So we can kind of generate, you know, a, a prequalification amount. Um, but, you know, if you want to go to the pre-approval process, if you're buying in the next three to six months, you probably need a pre-approval because you're going to start looking and the realtors are going to want a pre-approval. If you're like a year away, we don't have to do a pre-approval. Um, we can pre-qual. But we, we're willing to pre-qual anybody that wants to have that discussion with us. So let's go to the next um, the next slide. So general guidelines. Um, so these guidelines are just guidelines. We, we, we recommend that your housing payment doesn't exceed 36% of your gross income. That's monthly gross income. So if you're, let's say you make 60000 a year, that means your monthly gross income is 5000 You know, the guideline is your housing payment shouldn't be more than 1800 And then we take that and all these other items I just mentioned, like your car payment, your student loan payment, or your credit card minimum monthly payments, and they shouldn't exceed 43% of your gross income. So if you make 5000 a month, you know, 2150 is the max of the housing payment and these other minimum payments. However, uh, that's a guideline. If you don't have any payments besides the housing payment, we can push the housing payment to 43%. Um, you know, it depends. I mean, I tell people, what are you paying for rent now? And is that allowing you to save? That's a good guide of how much you can handle on a mortgage payment. Um, additionally, sometimes we can go a little over the 43% case by case. But these are the general guidelines. And I would really look at what you're paying for rent now as, as kind of a litmus. If you can afford that easily, you're saving, then maybe you could go a little higher on a mortgage payment or you want to stay around the same. Let's go to the next. So loan limit considerations. So the, the, the loan amount has some impact on the rate you'll get, but also how much you can put down. So that 724.5 is a loan limit that's set by the, the government-sponsored entities, Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac, in the Boston area, in most, in most counties, it's by county, uh, you can borrow up to that loan amount with 5% down on a single family or condo. Um, in, there is another limit that's 548.250. If you borrow up to 548,250, you could do that with 3% down if you're a first time home buyer. So that it, it's good for a first time home buyer if you can stay in that limit, you can buy something with less money down. The two family uh, limits are higher. Um, if you're looking in Worcester County, the limit's not going to be 724.5. It's going to be the 548.250. So county by county, these limits are determined. If you go above this 724.5 on a single or condo, you know, then you're into a jumbo loan. There's a little more required. We offer jumbo loans. We can go up to a million dollars with 5% down. And a lot of lenders don't do that right now. We can, but you would have PMI on that loan. Um, so, and, and there's a little more required on jumbo loans in terms of uh, reserve requirements. So we, on any loan, we want to know that you're not buying it with your last nickel. We want to know you have two months worth of payments in your assets after we close. And that could be retirement. You know, we can use retirement to demonstrate that without liquidating. When you get into a jumbo loan over the 724.5, depending on the county, but most counties around here, Middlesex, Essex, Norfolk, that's their limit. 
uh, the 724-5. But if you go beyond that, then we require that you have six months worth of payments after closing. So it's a little higher bar there. Um, so let's, 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 and the rate could be slightly different too. Let's Helen, talk about down we, payment. Hi, Helen. Before we continue to down payment, we have a couple of questions that may make, be a good break for at this point. Okay. One of the questions that we have uh, was a follow-up to an earlier question about the pre-approval. And their okay. question is, if I am paying the whole price up front, should I need some credit agency to pre-approve my purchase? If, if you're buying cash, is that what they mean? If they're going to yes. buy the, whole, the property with cash? Yes. Uh, they, don't, they don't need a pre-approval. They might, you know, they might, you know, uh, they might want to show that they have the assets. The realtor might say, can you, show, can you, would you be willing to provide your, you know, bank account showing that you have these assets to buy it? No, if you're buying cash, you don't need a pre-approval. Thank you. We had a couple of individuals ask if they, if we at the credit union or uh, Kimberly, if you know, if MGB EAP offers any First time home buyer programs or benefits for healthcare workers in purchasing a home? Not well, that I'm aware of uh, from the EAP standpoint. I think we would probably um, defer to the credit union on that one at this point. So, okay, Kimberly, I mean, we have the general uh, benefits we offer to all first time home buyers. We don't have a special program for first responders or. or or specifically healthcare workers. We do have, you know, a physician loan program, um, but that's very specific. There are pro, I have heard, and I know there are some programs for first responders out there. One program that we don't offer that I think would be a good one to look into, it's called Mass Housing. And that program is, they're not a lender, but it's a, it's a program that many lenders do offer. So, I would recommend that you look into that. I think they do have something for first responders and health care workers. Thank you. Another question that came in um, is regarding the ability to offer lo lower down payments. So I know you'll talk about that shortly. Uh, but then the other question that came in was when purchasing a multifamily and considering how much you can afford, does the 36% gross income still apply? Or do you factor in anticipated rents, making sure that the mortgage payment does not exceed 36% of the gross income. Yeah, um, on the mul there's little different rules on multifamilies and, and, and unfortunately uh, they put a new requirement in that if you're a first time home buyer, we cannot factor in the rents, the anticipated rents. We used to be able to take 75% of the rents, you know, and, and, and add that to your income. And then they, they that was changed uh, about a year ago. So you would have to qualify to carry the entire payment for the multifamily on your income without anticipated rent. If it's not your first home and you've been a homeowner, then we can use the anticipated rents to offset the mortgage payment. But for a first time home buyer, we cannot. Thank you. Unfortunately. Helen. So we have about 20 minutes left. Um, I'll turn it over to you and then I will uh, ask any additional questions that come in at the end of the presentation, if you would allow okay. for a I'll, couple I'll, minutes. Thank okay. you. Sure, I'll try to you know, go, keep it a little briefer. So the minimum down payment we require on a single or a condo is 3% if you're a first time home buyer up to a loan of 548. So that would be like a purchase price of around 570, I think. Beyond that, we require 5% down. If you're looking for a multifamily, we, on a fixed rate, a two-family, we need 15% down. For a three and four family, they want 20% down. We do have some adjustable programs. The adjustable rates are very low right now, where you can buy a two-family up to certain limits with 5% down. I know that there is a loan program called FHA. We're, we offer conventional financing. Um, which is, you know, really sellers love conventional pre-approvals, but FHA is another program where I think you can buy multifamilies with three and a half percent down. So I would write that down FHA as another program to maybe look into. Um, but sellers do like conventional financing on pre-approvals um, because on an FHA loan, on an appraisal, they're very fussy about if paint is peeling, they want it fixed. They want the, the property really 
in, in top condition in terms of those types of items, like a broken screen, where on conventional loans that we offer, the appraiser really doesn't care about a broken screen because it doesn't have any impact on the value. So that's what I just want to say about uh, about FHA. But let's move on to the next. So 3% down. Now, if you do buy with 3% down, you're going to have an additional monthly payment called private mortgage insurance. A lender is comfortable when they have 20% down. So this is like an insurance company that is insuring your loan and insuring to the lender that cushion, that difference that you, you don't have the 20%, but they feel confident in your ability to make your payments and, and, and they're willing to insure that loan. If you didn't pay, they would make us whole with that 20%. So it's a monthly premium in addition to your principal and interest and taxes and condo fee or homeowner's insurance. And it, it's based on the amount you put down, the loan amount, and your credit score. Really crucial to have a good credit score if you need PMI. Uh, example, I've seen a PMI, someone with a 680 credit score, I've seen a PMI payment be close to 350 a month. And when their credit, if their credit was 720, it would have been like 220 a month. So it, that's how sensitive it is to credit. And I know everyone can really work on their credit you know, it's possible to really improve yourself there. To, so if you do need PMI, you, you really are going to be in a good position to have a low premium. We, if you do have 10% to put down and you don't want to have uh, PMI, we do have an alternative where we could give you a second mortgage in place of the 10%. Instead of getting 90% first mortgage with PMI, you would get an 80% first mortgage at a 10% second mortgage from us and then you wouldn't have PMI. So that's an alternative depending on, you know, your situation that might work for you. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so which loan is right for you? Let's go on to the next slide. Um, we have fixed and adjustable rate loans. Right now, the 30-year the fixed rates are in the mid twos. They're fantastic. You know, we would, if you're a first time home buyer and you're gonna stay in your property, I, I would be hard for me to recommend an adjustable to you, you know, with the rates like this. Adjustable loan rate mortgages work for people that are, say, buying a condo, and I know that I'm not going to live here for more than five years. So you would get maybe get an adjustable rate mortgage because the rates are lower. So the adjustable rate mortgage, I'm going to give you an example. A 10-1, let's say, what does that mean? It's still based on 30 years with the first 10 years fixed at the initial rate. So say our 10-1-R might be 2.375, but our 30-year fix might be 2.625. So you can see you bet you get a lower rate, but, you know, and they are good in some situations. We would have to discuss, I would have to talk with you about, you know, what, what, what you're thinking, what your plans are, how you feel your income is solid, because after the, after the fixed period on an adjustable, the rate could adjust every single year. So if rates are up in 10 years, you could see a payment shock on an adjustable rate mortgage. And if rates are up and you want to refinance, you're still going to have a higher rate and be wishing you took the fixed rate when they, when they were uh, like they are now. So let's go on to the, to the next. Um, and then what are the closing costs? So I'm going to briefly just uh, talk about this. You, so, in, so what do you need to, to, to buy? You need your down payment, you need your closing costs, which I estimate are like one to one and a half percent of your purchase price. And, and we have specific estimates on our website. If you wanna go on our website and, and run a scenario and look at the closing costs, you can do that. And then you need to have your reserves, like I mentioned. So I always go over closing costs with everyone because if you say, I have 30,000 for the down payment, I'll say, is that including closing costs? Or should we use 25 for the down payment and, and save five for the closing cost? So think about one to one and a half percent of the loan amount. Uh, any lender you talk to should give you a loan estimate, which is a sample of what the closing cost would be. Um, and you can use that as a comparison tool to compare lenders. And we have our estimates right on our, our website. So uh, that's all I think I'll say about closing costs at this point. Um, and we just want to provide you with a roadmap. I mean, I've given you a lot of information, and I know I've probably overloaded you. I hope you just got a, the few high points are about getting a really good realtor, getting pre-qualified, you know, no obligation on that, 
Uh, those are the two main things. And really, really, really working on your credit to make sure your credit is excellent. Those are the, the high points of this hour that I hope uh, that, that, that you got out of it. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, step by step, it, we're just giving you, these are the steps that, that would happen when you got an offer accepted. Uh, you know, first you get your pre-approval, then when you get an accepted offer, you submit an application to the credit union or another lender. You lock your rate. You'd be provided with a, a loan estimate, which discloses all the costs to you. And we can't just, uh, it's by law, we can't just change that. We can't tell you this is going to cost you 300 and then by the end change it to 600 uh, it's very regulated right now, so you're protected from things like that that were happening in the financial crisis. Then you're going to get all, gather all your documents, income and asset documents for the past two years. And let's go to the next step. You're going to provide those to us. We are going to conduct an appraisal. The credit union or your lender is going to have an independent appraiser, give them a, a, a value of that property uh, using uh, appraisal principles. And then we're going to put that together with your income and asset documents, issue you a commitment that, yes, we're going to lend you this money. Uh, and then we're going to contact our attorney and tell them prepare for closing. And you'll get another document called the closing disclosure, which is kind of like the companion to the loan estimate that we gave you in the beginning. And we can't change. Everything's compared. What did we tell you it was going to be? What's the actual? And the closing cost, if we didn't tell you that something was going to change, we can't change it. So you don't feel that, you know, concern that anything could change drastically from what you expect. And let's go on to the, um, to the next. And then, you know, before you close, you're going to walk through the property, like the day before you close or the morning before you close, just to make sure that everything is as it is supposed to be. Um, and, and that, you know, there's no damage from moving or they didn't leave things behind, uh, et cetera. And then you're going to go to the uh, closing and, and you're going to sign the paperwork. There are remote options um, because of COVID. You, if you're buying a single family, you're going to have to get one year of homeowner's insurance paid up front. That's going to be disclosed to you in the loan estimate. That's not going to be a surprise cost to you. Uh, one thing I'm going to tell you also, really important, if you do get an accepted offer at some time and you're in process, you do not inquire, don't open any new credit cards, don't buy a card, don't do those things when you're in, in the loan process because it could derail you. We've calculated your debt ratio based on your credit when you applied. We pull credit at the end just to make sure you haven't gotten any new loans that could change your qualification. So you really don't want to be getting any new credit while you're in the loan process. And if you're thinking of buying a home, I would put, a, if your car is working or whatever, I wouldn't take on any new debts until you know your qualification to make sure that, you know, I've had someone, you just bought a car with a $700 payment. That drops you to a three fifty qualification, $350,000, where you could have been $500,000. You know, so, you, so think about that, too. And that's, let's go to the next uh, Sarah. So just at the closing, it's about 45 minutes, and uh, that's that. You're going to bring your checkbook in case there's any adjustments. If you said you were going to keep the swing set or keep a chandelier, you would just pay the seller, you know, for that item. Uh, that's not likely. Uh, you need to bring your photo ID. There's a lot of notarizing that goes on at the closing. And in about one hour, you're closed. They go on record at the registry, and you've got the keys, and you're a homeowner. And um, that's about how it goes. We have a lot of resources for you. So uh, Green Path, I don't know, Magdalia, if you want to say anything about, I know you know more about the program th than I do, but it's, I've referred a lot of people there that have had, you know, issues with their credit and just someone to review it with them. And it's a free service to credit union members. And people have really given me good feedback on that. If you, if you do qualify, uh, you know, for, for a HUD, HUD low income designation, we give you an extra 500 off closing costs, and then you can always get your credit report free from each bureau every year. And then just some Redfin, Zillow, those are some resources for, for you know, browsing. There's, there's many others, too, um, you know, for looking at properties. And then, you know, our express pre-approval, that would be if you wanted your credit pulled. If you just want to have a consult, 
I would go on the website and make a phone app appointment with myself or one of my colleagues. That would be the first thing. And we can go over anything in detail that, you know, there's just a lot of information and, um, you know, you can't take it all in at once when you're making, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest financial decisions you're probably going to make in your life. So does anyone have, I hope there's some questions. Actually, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, so good timing, Helen. So I'll start off um, in the order that we receive them. The first question being, we are a couple in our 50s and one of us is a first time home buyer. Would we still qualify for the first time home, first time program? I am, see, there's so much information to present that I didn't, didn't tell you, you know, I, I leave out some details that I don't want to leave out. So on the first time, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. On the first time home buyer, we only need one of the two people to be a first time home buyer. And if you haven't owned a home in three years, you are considered a first time home buyer. So if you've owned a home previously, but it's more than three years ago, you're, we can give you the first time home buyer benefits again. So, so I'm glad that question was asked. Thank you. And we do have um, about six more questions, which I feel good that we can get through. Um, if I were okay. to use an ARM loan, what's the general time frame before I'm allowed to refinance to a fixed rate loan? Okay, so at the credit union, none of our loans have prepayment penalties. So there's no time limit that you have to uh, keep an arm loan. You could have it for six months and refinance to a fixed rate loan. The only thing is when you refinance, you have to pay closing costs. So, you, you know, you don't want to, uh, you know, pay closing costs more than once in a, in a short period of time. But there, there, there's no restriction on, on refinancing an arm loan. And one other thing on our arms at the credit union, I just want to mention this, you know, we're a portfolio lender, meaning we have the ability, we lend our own money. So I know I mentioned we lend to the standards of the secondary market, which is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And that's what most lenders do. But we also have the ability, if your situation just doesn't quite fit their criteria, we can still do the loan and keep it in our portfolio. So that's a nice thing when you're looking at lenders, if they have that capability, that's a plus for you, that, that they're able to be a portfolio lender. And we're committed to, to the segments that we serve. So if there's any way we can get it done, we will. Thank you, Helen. Another question, what is the difference between pre-approval and a pre-qual? Oh, okay, that's a good question. So a pre-qual is, we're talking about your income just verbally. You're telling me what your income is. You're talking about how much money you have for a down payment. You're telling me what your debts are on your credit report. And you're telling me what you think your credit score is. And I'm giving you responses based on what you're telling me. The pre-approval is I have your name, address, date of birth, and social. I'm pulling a hard credit report on you. And I'm looking at the debts that appear there. And I'm getting your, you know, maybe looking at, your asset statements or a pay stub. We do a lot of verbal on pay stub and assets, even on pre-approval, but it, it's more of a hard pull on the credit. That's the real difference. And a lot of people are really skittish about that, you know, because the pre-approval is only good for 90 days because the credit is only good for 90 days. So if I pull, do a pre-approval and you don't find anything for six months, I have to pull your credit again. So that that's the only thing. I mean, it is, it's a necessary evil. If you're out there looking, you want to make offers, you have to have the pre-approval. If you have good credit, the credit pull for the mortgage should be very minimal impact to you. Um, if you have thin credit, you know, and, and some issues, then it's a little going to be more impactful and we'd want to be more strategic on Thank when you. we do it. Thank you. Would I be able to request PMI removal at 80% loan to value ratio? Yeah, so there's there's uh, there's two ways you can remove your PMI. One is um, if you pay down the principal to 80% of the purchase price or appraised value, which should likely are the same, we can remove the PMI right away. If you hit the lottery next week and you close this week, you can pay the loan down, apply to the principal, and the PMI request it removed. That's different than requesting that it be removed via appreciation and value. If you think your property value has gone up and you want to request removal, um, there's a two-year waiting period on that. And we require that you request that we do an appraisal, which you have to pay for, which is around 450. 
but but it pays for itself if it, if you have the value. If the value's there, and we it could be eighty, it could be seventy five, depending on market conditions. Um, what the actual number is, where we'll remove PMI. We've removed a ton of PMI this year. I love it when people reach out to me and say, Helen, I think I've got the value. It's awesome. A lot of those people are refinancing now because the rates are lower too. So there is a way to remove PMI and approximately at 80%, uh, it can be removed. But for appreciation, there's a two year waiting period. There is Thank a you. caveat to that. I just wanna say, if you've done substantial improvements and you have the receipts, the two-year waiting period could be waived. See, there's so much information on everything. <laughs> I could keep going. Thank you, Helen. Um, we do have about a good amount of questions left. I'm not sure we're going to be able to get through all of them. We have about three minutes left. I did okay. put in the chat the page where you can make appointments with Helen or any of our other mortgage loan originators. We also will get an email with the presentation, with the recording, with the slides, and with the, our MLO's contact information so that you can have that available to you. Um, in the last three minutes that we have, I am going to continue to ask you a couple of questions. And the next one that we have is if you're taking a loan from retirement to use as a down payment, would this affect your buying ability? Wow, these questions are really great. No, we don't. If you take a loan from your retirement, you're going to have to a monthly payment to pay it back. That monthly payment is not factored into your debt ratio for qualification for the mortgage. So you don't have to worry about that. Does that yeah. answer it? Thank you. Okay. And how is a mortgage adjusted if I want to sell my house before the end of the mortgage term? Will there be any penalties? So there's, there's, there's no penalty to pay off your mortgage early. So every month, you make a payment and your principal balance gets reduced a little bit. And if you're going to pay off the mortgage, this is a misconception. You don't have to pay us the interest that you would pay over 30 years. You, if you pay the mortgage off next month, you only pay the principal balance plus, plus any interest due as of next month for the mortgage. There's no prepayment penalty at all to pay off the mortgage. You just pay the interest up until the day you pay it off. Thank you so much, Helen. And I think that is all the time that we have for questions, but I will invite Kimberly in case there's anything you want to say about MGB EAP or anything else. Feel free if there's anything you'd like to add. Um, on our website, we have um, a special section for home buying. So please feel free to um, you know, come on our website, take a peek, go to the financial, um, legal and housing tab, and you'll find a lot of the resources that Helen was talking about, including that, um, green, green path, um, as well as other different resources that you can find for home financing. So please visit our, our website and reach out to us at EIP if you have any concerns, um, or need any other support. Okay, I, I, is that that is that all the time we have? I think Magdalia, right? And that Sarah. is. Thank you so much, and I'll turn it over to Sarah for any closing comments. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Like Magdalia said, we'll get you this information within about 48 hours to the email that you registered with. Um, so if any questions do come up, like Helen said. Um, hopefully you reach out to a mortgage loan originator. They are there to help you. That is their job. So we are glad that you've joined us today and we hope to see you at some of our EAP presentations in the future as well.